Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for being here. We are starting James chapter 4, looking at verses 1 through 12. Uh, we will review a little bit and not get through all these verses. We'll read through them. But we're talking about, again, worldly wisdom or worldly wisdom from uh, above that overtakes the worldly wisdom that we're living in. There's some features that we've seen as far as uh, worldly wisdom is going to be self-ambitious or self-centered. Uh, wisdom from above is going to be not just peaceful, that's one of the key things, but it's th that we noticed last week it's going to be reasonable. I mean, it's going to be logical. Uh, it's going to be full of mercy. We'll review that. Uh, James now, after describing it last week in, in verse or chapter 3 of the features of this, he's now in chapter 4 going to uh, address it. It's a theme that's been running throughout the book, uh, talking about some basic features as far as wisdom, which is applied in speech and uh, applied in the way you deal with the rich and the poor, how you deal with oppression or opposition difficulties. Uh, the worldly wisdom of the world, again, is going to be self-centered and is always going to lead to some kind of conflict, uh, opposition, uh, tension. Uh, it's going to get very graphic here in chapter 4 as, as James describes it. And we'll have to decide in chapter 4 these verses if he's just being metaphorical, like he's going to use the word kill. Uh, are they actually killing? And it could be in the culture, especially those that were in the zealot movement, and it's going to manifest eventually. Uh, or was it just uh, like Jesus talks about if you have hate for your brother or if you have this conflict that's unresolved that you're pursuing, developing, it's, you've murdered them in your mind. And again, we'll, we'll talk about that. Uh, the idea here of the wisdom from above is going to be peaceful. It's not going to be self-centered. It's going to be full of mercy. But the thing, as I said last week, and I said it already, that's really impressive is that it's going to be reasonable. Uh, it's going to be able to think, be logical. It's going to have to be, be able to use words, vocabulary, uh, in a way that can lead to truth, reason, logic, uh, persuasiveness. Where up in here, the words are going to be used to enrage, to drive your point home. Uh, op opponents are going to be oppressed, uh, silenced, censored. Uh, and again, the reason this is important for us now in, in, at this time in history is because I think we find ourselves in this very world right now where it's hard for us to, unless we make a conscious effort to embrace this wisdom from above. Again, last week I mentioned uh, this wisdom that James talks about, wisdom from above could become the spirit from above in Paul's writings. It's, it's the same same theme. You've got the, the fruit or the manifestations of wisdom from above manifesting as the spirit, uh, the fruit of the spirit in Galatians and in Paul's ministry. And James is, again, describing the same thing, uh, I think, but it's something that is challenging for us, at least I think for myself, challenging for myself to live in the world, to engage in the world, to listen to the world, to try and advance in the world, even trying to advance as a Christian to engage the world without doing it in a worldly fashion. Uh, you know, silencing, uh, censoring. Uh, you can even see the church doing this, and you know, if you want to pick out periods of church history where the church got in control of power and they would begin to censor, not allow. It becomes illegal. Uh, and that, that are they advancing the cause of righteousness or are they using the worldly wisdom, uh, the spirit of this age to advance Christianity, which is always going to backfire? Uh, James is going to say in chapter 4, verse 2, it leads to every kind of vile practice or every kind of evil practice. So anytime, you, this is the dangerous part, anytime you, you use worldly wisdom or the ways of the world, even to advance your cause of Christianity, it's going to lead to the world, the flesh, and the devil, the fruits of these things. And that's where I think you can find, you know, in church history, in local churches, in your own life, doing things that you think are for the cause of righteousness. But as you get into it, it's like, wait, this is producing the wrong kind of fruit. It's strife. It's unreasonable. Uh, we're having to win our battles by just censoring or canceling or firing or 
uh, getting rid of. Uh, uh, and, and again, that's, it's again, it's a, a tough thing to talk about because we are living in the middle of it. And it's one of these things where you could talk about it, draw, draw a diagram and talk about it in a biblical principle. But then when you overlay it onto your own life, it's like, can you make that adjustment? Are you willing to make that adjustment and realize, wait a minute, my entire life or this entire area of my life is, is totally worldly and I'm operating in a worldly uh, practice. Uh, so here we go. Let's read through it in the NIV, uh, chapter 4 of James. And because I'm going to start here uh, it, when we start doing the notes, look in chapter 3, verse 13. Uh, chapter 3, verse 13. This is from last week, and we'll review this briefly here in a moment. Who is wise and understanding among you? Okay, th that would be what we'd want. That would be us. We want to be these people, okay? Well, let him show it by his good life, by deeds done in the humility that comes from wisdom. So if you're going to be wise and understanding, we're going to see it in what you're doing. And that doing is going to include what you're saying, the words coming out of your mouth. And it's going to be things that are done and said in humility. But if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. So there's your, there's your negatives, bitter envy, selfish ambition. So it's all about me, me, me. Bitter envy, you've got it or someone else has it, whatever it is. And I'm envious, I don't want them successful, I want it for myself. And selfish ambition, me-centered, I'm going to want to do something Whatever I'm doing, I'm trying to do it for myself. So I'm going to oppose others and advance my own cause. And so there it is. If you harbor envy and selfish ambition in your heart, do not boast about it or deny the truth. And that would be interesting because you can see people, if you have like uh, people that are promoting uh, their way of life or promoting their, their uh, if it be some kind of a, a, a political campaign, if it be some kind of a business campaign, if it be in sports, if it be in academics, well, here's how you do it. And you're going to, in a sense, be envious, and you're going to be self-advancing, and you're boasting, you're doing lectures, you're doing, you know, TED Talks, and it's like, wait a minute, all this is, is you're just, you're boasting about your, your, I'm getting ahead in life because you're being envious, and you have selfish ambition. It's like, don't, don't boast about it. that's that's not what we want to boast about. Do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from heaven, again, notice this, Wisdom is not of this age, of this world. It's coming down from heaven. Again, that's where you can kind of make the correlation with the Spirit. It comes down from heaven. But this is, and it describes it, earthly, unspiritual, and of the devil. And there's your three descriptions of this. It's, it's earthly, of this age. It's unspiritual, which means, in this sense, spiritual is being used positively, where it's, it's spiritual life. It's from God. It's the Spirit of God. It's bringing renewal, life, purity. Uh, the opposite would be, mental or of the soul or things that you're thinking of of this age now when we start talking about spiritual again i want to just put a parenthesis in here uh in in our age we are living in an age that's going to become more and more and more spiritually attuned and people are if you have just that basic ideal of if it's unspiritual and spiritual unspiritual would be humanistic you know secular humanism there's no god there's no nothing beyond what we can measure but then all of a sudden you realize wait 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 there's another world out there a spiritual dimension well yeah but it includes not just god the spirit of god the wisdom from above it includes angels it includes fallen angels it includes demon demons it includes an entire underworld and so in that case unspiritual uh is not just secular unspiritual in, in the mature sense would also include anything demonic. But if we're just going to go with, with the basic concept of, oh, this is spiritual, this is something that can't be measured by science, it's something coming from the, the spiritual dimension. It's like, well, well, be careful. There's things in the spiritual dimension that you do not, do not want. And so right now in our culture, if someone says, oh, well, they're very spiritual. Well, yeah, mysticism is very spiritual. Demonism is very spiritual. So it, it, we can't just, there's, there's two ways of using unspiritual and spiritual. James is using it in spiritual is wisdom from above and unspiritual is the wisdom of this age from your soul from your mind from your own natural intellect so in that case unspiritual would be negative well if we just make spiritual positive and we open it up and then we're going to compare it to humanism or secularism 
and spiritual. There's another dimension. Oh, well, anything over here is good. Well, no, no. Now we've got to divide spiritual in half, and there's going to be a negative side of the spiritual also, which involves Satan and the underworld. James is talking about here of unspiritual in the sense it's un godly it's 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 just of this of the soulish nature so earthly unspiritual and then of the devil that's what we've said the world the flesh and the devil and where you have these things this envy and selfish ambition for where you have envy and selfish ambition there you find disorder and every evil practice so wherever you're going to get there and even if you're a christian or you're a church, or you're a religious institution, and you're trying to do something for a good cause, if you're going to use this worldly wisdom, envy, selfish ambition, and you're going to use the area of the earthly, the unspiritual, and the demonic, uh, you're going to begin to produce not what you think you want. You're going to produce a disorder, chaos. It's going to be unorganized, and every evil practice. Now, chapter 3 verse 17 but the wisdom that comes from heaven now here's there's seven of them listed here two of them go together first of all uh, first is pure then peace loving considerate submissive full of mercy good fruit impartial and sincere and uh, the two that full of mercy and good fruit would be one that goes together and the thing that i'm imp impressed with is the impartial and another way of looking at it, we'll see it in the notes is the ideal of reasonable, of where you can, you can actually sit down and with your words present an argument that is logical and reasonable. And if you're doing it in a peaceful way, uh, submissive to the truth, uh, you're going to produce right here, peacemakers who sow in peace raise a harvest of righteousness. The result of that is going to be righteousness, but notice the righteousness is going to come through peacemakers, which would be those that are walking in wisdom, that are sowing the seeds in peace. So you're a peacemaker, sowing in peace, with, we'd consider that the fruit of the Spirit, and you'll produce the fruits of righteousness. Okay, that's from last week, and we'll review it again, we'll get to the notes. But chapter 4, verse 1. This, I think, it's a, it's a new chapter, but it continues the thought. It's now the application of what he's just said. This is what, you don't want the wisdom, wisdom of the world, you want the wisdom from above. Now, what causes fights and quarrels among you? You have fights and quarrels in your in your group it, these people that he's writing to he's not talking about outside in the world there's fights and quarrels he's saying that's the way the world does it this is the way you should do it but now that i'm looking at what you're doing you're the ones with fights and quarrels it's not like well the world's bad okay that that's a given the problem is you are having fights and quarrels among you and don't they come, now here's a rhetorical question, don't they come from your desires that battle within you? And we're going to look at all this in the English Standard Version and then the Greek words. Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? So you're having fights and quarrels amongst your own people. Why do you have fights and quarrels? It's because inside of you is desires that are battling, the NIV is saying. So you've got a problem inside, which is you do not have the wisdom from above. And you're getting together with other people who do not have the wisdom from above, with their own desires that are battling their own members, their own soul, and then you interact with others, and of course, you're going to have fights and quarrels. Basically, everybody is self-centered and envious of everyone else, and now you're going to get together as the body of Christ or as believers, and you're going to, you're going to end up with fights and quarrels because no one's working together. Everyone's working for their own advantage. Uh, desires and battle within you, you want, now he goes, you want something, but you don't get it. You kill and covet, and you cannot have what you want. You quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. And when you do ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives. So again, there's the asking of God, but it's going to be interesting because they're, they're, the not only he says you're, you're not having, getting what you, you, you want, because you're doing it in a worldly way, and it's disastrous. You're causing chaos and division. Now, the best thing would be, would be to ask God. But when you ask God, you're asking God to join with you in coveting. So you're, you're coveting, and you don't want to ask God because you know he won't help. But then it's like, well, I'm going to ask God. God, will you help me covet? It's like, well, you're asking for the wrong reason. No, he's not going to help you covet. Can you help me sin, God? It's like, No. And so he says, one, you're not asking God. That's your first problem, not your first problem, but one of your problems is you're not asking God. Okay, we ask God. Well, he's not going to participate in this because you, you, you can't go to him and bring him onto your team in your corruption. 
I think of the verse where uh, Joshua is approaching Jericho. He's on there scouting it out. And the angel of the Lord appears from him. And Joshua draws his sword and says, are you for us or for the enemy? And the angel of the Lord says, neither. Now, I mean, that's, that's, this, that's this section right here. Are you for this worldly side or this worldly side? Uh, neither. I, uh, I, I've, as commander of the Lord's host, I've come to you. You're going to have to join the wisdom from above. And again, if we want to make it political, if we want to make it, uh, you know, whatever kind of, you know, are you for the right or for the left? Who's God for? Is he for the right or for the left? It's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. well, neither. Uh, but as commander, Lord, I've come to you to tell you, here's how I'm going to do things. And the right and the left are going to have to side with the Lord. And again, I really think we can see this in, in po- politics right now because we're, we're in the midst of uh, 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 unraveling society and nothing makes sense because there are those that are intentionally taking this in a completely different direction, trying to undermine this. Others are trying to support this. Others are, we would say, some are trying to dismantle America as a nation and and reform it into something else, maybe a worldly uh, organization with the other, whatever, who knows what's going on. And then there's others that are like waving the flag, go America. Well, I would be on the side of, you know, the nation, but at the same time, those over here that are waving the flag, uh, we are in a worldly debate, a worldly struggle between one side of worldly wisdom and another side of worldly wisdom. And you're just going to produce all kinds of chaos and every evil practice is going to come about this. And you're going to be part of it because you've joined with either one side or the other. And that's like Joshua. Who are you? Are you for us or for the enemy? As commander of the Lord's host, no, I've come to you. And now this is the wisdom from above. In this situation, in this culture that we find ourselves in, we're going to have to embrace a wisdom from above. And that wisdom from above is not going to be going through one political agenda or another agenda. It's going to be coming from above. And then you'll find yourself possibly in, in no man's land or not able to engage in the same conversations Uh, in the same way uh i mean we got some basic morals some basic right and wrong but as soon as you get into a a, a side if it be you know you know pro-life if it be pro-marriage if it be pro-nation it's like all of those i would agree with but you're going to have to approach it from wisdom from above if you're going to do any earthly good Otherwise, you're going to find yourself, your main objective is we are against them and we're pushing our agenda. And well, now you're in a division. You're just going to, your division is going to keep growing and growing somehow. And again, I'm not saying I I would know how to incorporate this except to start with your own life. But here it is. We're going to spend time talking about this. I mean, I think this is pertinent right here. And they were in this position. If If this is 45 AD, they were at this very point where you've got three basic Jewish groups that you can fight for, plus the Romans are coming in. You've, you've, got, your, you've got your Democrats, you've got your Republicans, you've got your independents, and they're all fighting amongst themselves inside the country of Judea uh, in Jerusalem. But here comes the Romans, or here comes China, that's going to take you all out. So it's like, They're busy fighting amongst themselves, and here comes the world power coming in, and you're going to have to get yourself understand, none of you are going to win in this worldly battle. You are all going to lose, and if you cannot figure this out and avoid some conflicts, you're going to be overtaken by a worldly power, in their case, the Romans. And I think that's where we're at right now. And not that there's not truth to be found in the natural world, but you can't approach it in a worldly method and start advancing it uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a selfish ambition or envious way. Well, here it is. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Do they not come from your desires that battle within you? You want something and you don't get it. You kill and covet. You cannot have what you want. You quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. You adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world is hatred towards God? And this is going to be a huge division. There, are you working for the a, this age or are you working for the age to come? 
anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. And that's where that, are you for us or for the enemy? For neither, but I've come to you. Now, if you're going to say, well, you better be on our side, God better be on our side, he's not on your side. You've got to be on God's side. I mean, that's, that's a radical, I mean, that's a radical thought. Is like, is God on my side? I mean, God is never on your side. You, you ha- he's not, he's not going to move from his position to your position. You're going to have to t- take your position and line it up with God's position. Now, again, that doesn't mean, you know, he's not going to help you, but it means you're going to have to be working from his position, working from his base of operation to understand and see the world to get him on your side. Because right here, they, we're, we're coveting. Come here and help us covet. It's like, no. You've got to come here and get rid of coveting and see things from the position of wisdom and now ask me for something. Now, now this is where that verse, ask me for anything and I'll do it. Well, now that's clearly not these people over here. Well, we want you to do this. What about answering our prayer? No, you need to gravitate towards God and now from this position, now start asking things. And all of a sudden, you're asking God to do the things that God is doing. Look how, look how Jesus prayed. Jesus prayed, I mean, the number one thing is that God's will be done. I mean, if you pray nothing else, pray, God, have your will be done in my life. And, I, and, and it's like, well, I don't even know what it is. Well, just start praying that. And say, I want your will done in my life, and then start submitting to God. Well, that's going to come up. Uh, when you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your own pleasures. You adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world is hatred towards God? Anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Or do you think Scripture says without reason that the Spirit He caused to live in us envies intensely? He gave a Spirit to you, the new life, and He's trying to bring you into His orbit, and you're over here pulling it the other way. Now that Spirit came to you with the intention of purifying you and helping you mature in Christ. And you've taken that new life, the Spirit of God, and says, we want this to work down here and work in the world and produce more worldly things. It's like, no, that Spirit is that's a gravitational force that's pulling you towards God. And if you're going to resist, it's going to destroy you. And the natural tendency is to resist. And that's why this next verse comes in. Or do you think Scripture says without reason that the Spirit He caused to live in us in these je- intensely, but He gives us more grace? In other words, while you're pulling away from the Spirit, He's pulling out more grace, trying to teach you, give you time, so you'll submit, in a sense, to that that wisdom from above and let that Spirit start drawing you in. And again, that whole process is going to be the increase of being reasonable, of hearing the words, of hearing truth, understanding them and applying and conforming to the Word. But He gives us more grace. That is why the Scripture says... God opposes the proud, I meaning when the Spirit comes, when that wisdom comes, and you oppose Him, you resist Him, and you're proud. I'm not changing. I want God to do it my way. Well, you are in opposition with God. And I, I think we can go back, and, and Tony and I go look back at least in our lives, uh, and I'm talking about myself personally, of where I'm trying to follow God, but I'm doing it my way. And in the long run, it's like I end up finding God's opposing me. Uh, it, it's not working out. And, and finally, it's like, well, right here. But he gives grace to the humble. It's like, okay, this isn't working. I, I'll give up. I will follow you. And all of a sudden, there's grace. And that's where you start growing and being productive. But not in the way you thought. You had your own idea. And then here's, here's the key verse right here. Submit yourselves then to God. In this power struggle, submit yourselves to God and resist the devil and he will flee from you. All right there. It's like when you see, when you understand this, it's like I do not understand, but I am going to submit to God this wisdom from above, and I'm going to resist the the earth, the worldly, earthly, the unspiritual, which would be you know the the soulish way of man, and and the demonic. And again, even as you look at that right there, submit yourselves into God, resist the devil, and resisting the devil and submitting to God would mean hearing more God and hearing less devil. Uh, there's there's a danger in 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 not hearing god's word but only hearing the evil if you understand what i'm saying uh possibly this is why jesus the demons would always want to chirp you know chirp out during it we're going through mark and during the synagogue services he'd cast out a demon they'd want to like we know who you are they want to like throw a little bit into the sermon 
You know, they want to test. We'd like to testify. You are the Son of God. We know who you are. He would not let them speak. It's like, no, do not look at this. You know, he's like casting the demons out. Where'd they go? They're gone. Don't worry about it. It's not like, well, let's go ahead and interview this demon right here. You know, and they start talking to the demon. And well, this demon, it's like, it's like, no, no, no. Shut up. Resist the devil. Submit to God. Keep hearing the word of God. And that would be a key right here is to just allow your soul to be saturated with the truth, with the word of God. And uh, Paul says this way, uh, be concerning evil, be ignorant. What, what are they doing? Uh, be ignorant. In Ephesians, and we talked about this in Ephesians many years ago, several years ago, not many. But expose the deeds of darkness with the light. In other words, you're not supposed to go out and expose the deeds of darkness by going out and providing lists and details of all the evil. He says, be ignorant of it. Be ignorant of that. Don't, don't even understand it. Uh, by, my mind's starting to uh, wander down a bunch of tra- uh, different trails. But uh, in, in school, uh, we, we make little projects. We're making race cars right now. And I let the kids, you know, decorate them, and then they write numbers on them, and they write like, a name of a, you know, their race car, or whatever, you know. And there's 250 of the kids, and so you're going to get a wide variety of children. Uh, and I say, make sure it's appropriate, you know. I said, don't write anything, an inappropriate letter, an inappropriate word, you know. And then I always say, so I always do this. I said, don't write anything inappropriate. I says, you know, I, otherwise I'll have to just, I'll have to throw it away, and I don't want to have to do that. So just make sure it's for. I said, don't write inappropriate things like. And at that when I say, don't write any important things like, you, just, you can just hear the head swing looking at me because they're, they're listening to me talk. And I said, well, don't, don't write any appropriate things like, like I'm about ready to give them a list. You know, I, I don't. And I said, aha, what do you want to do? And they're like, oh, well, man, Mr. Mears, you scared us. And I say, and I said, if I don't know, if you write something and it looks, and I have seen some things, it's like that looks, I don't even know what that means. But there's a thing called Urban Dictionary. You may have heard of it. And you can go in there, you can type in an Urban Dictionary, type in anything, and it will tell you what it means. And there are things on Urban Dictionary, it's like, no, I didn't want it and learn, I didn't want to know that. But little, you know, abbreviations and things like this, it's like there's things out there, it's like, I've never heard of that. And there it is. And there, sometimes kids will, again, rarely, but it will happen. They'll write something, it's like, you know, and then I'll go in, I'll check it, and I go, no, I can tell you, I can tell you now two or three stories of where I'm like, this doesn't look right. But I have, n- I have no understanding that this just doesn't look. So I, I type it in. It's like, oh, it's not right. And it's very, very, and it's like, I would never even thought of that. But nonetheless, uh, that, that's the idea of being, you can go down that urban dictionary and just read through the whole thing, all of these inappropriate things, and you'll be a worse person because you read all those definitions of all that corrupt stuff. It's like, wow, I know all about this corruption. You don't want to know about the corruption. So resist this. Have the demons quiet. Do not be talking and submit yourself to God and resist the devil. Shut up. We don't want to hear any of this, but submit to God. Hear the word. Anyway, that's what it says right here. God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and a promise, and he will flee from you. Come, that's an, that's an amazing thought. He's fleeing from you. He's going to give up. Come near to God, and he'll come near to you. That's that gravitational. There's the, um, it doesn't say, God is going to come to you. No, God is there. He's unmovable. You come close to him, and as you're coming close to him, he's coming close to you. And I think the idea there is that you're going towards him. He's not going to compromise and come to you. You need it to be transformed and come to him. And here's a list. Wash your hands, you sinners. Now, he's talking to believers. He's not talking... He's not talking to the world. He's not talking to all those people out there. Oh, all those, those, those heathen. You know, he's talking to the people that have embraced Jesus Christ. He's already called them adulterers, the lovers of the world, haters of God. Come near to God, and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you, you sinners, and uh, purify your hearts, you double-minded. There's his word. We've used that a couple times already. Double-minded, meaning you're, you're saying one thing, but you're committed to another thing. Uh, double-minded, grieve, mourn, and wail, change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom, humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up. Now, again, lift you up in his kingdom, not lift you up in, well, and I remember making deals with God, you know, in my 20s, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to, okay, God, this is what I want, I keep trying this, but can I get this, if I will do this, will I get this? It's like I'm, I'm compromising with God, will you, I, I'll do this, will you fight for me if I'll do this? It's like, no, it's like, 
Humble yourself, and he will lift you up in his, in his area, in his will. Uh, humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up. Brothers, do not slander one another. Anyone who speaks against his brother or judges him speaks against the law and judges it. When you judge the law, you are not keeping it, but sitting in judgment on it. There is only one lawgiver and judge, the one who is able to save and destroy. But you, who are you to judge your neighbor? Now again, that right there is probably the, one of the most popular anti-Christian verses today, is you cannot judge, you cannot judge. And again, that, that right there, that's true right there in the context. But at the same time, when you're looking at good and evil, and you've got people that are promoting evil and people that are promoting good or God is calling you to good and you've got Satan, you're going to have to have some kind of discernment. You're going to have to do some kind of judging. So that judging, we are judging. I'm judging my thoughts all the time. Well, I should be judging my thoughts all the time. I find myself occasionally judging my thoughts or judging my behavior. Or likewise, you're going to judge others like I'm not going to do that this judgment would be more on the ideal of being on the worldly side of being envious and jealous and you're trying to destroy this person as much as you're judging that is wrong and i'm going to continue to move towards god and this person can here's the truth join with the truth or you know go your own way the ideal of judging here would be like div causing division amongst people instead of making a call because there's verses where paul is going to say uh you know judge those among you and, and stay away from those who are divisive I mean, you're there's a place where you just to be a christian you're going to have to be continuously be judging but this is judging for destruction we'll talk about it more but this is that verse right there if that's if you want to cut out all do the thomas jefferson and just cross everything else out and just cut this little verse out right there and make that your bible this, do you have a bible yes i've got a bible it's a, it's four verses long it's uh, uh, do not judge anyone. Anyone who judges is sitting in law and you're not keeping it. There's only one lawgiver and judge. Who are you to judge? Okay, that's, that's, and all Christians are now held to that standard. It's like, well, then now you're, it's like, what do you do? It's like, well, that's where, again, reasonable is such a key word. Reasonable, you should be able to reason. All right, that's the NIV reading of those verses. I apologize. We go back to the chapter three on the notes. And what we have in chapter 3, verse 14 through 16 is going to be the world, the worldly wisdom. And this, again, just sets the stage. Uh, the, in the I English Standard Version, uh, it says this. This describes the worldly wisdom that produces worldly behavior. So this is worldly wisdom, and it's going to produce worldly behavior, or what is going to eventually be called earthly unspiritual and demonic and that is this worldly wisdom and you know we can think of wisdom and when we talk about wisdom uh, i i wouldn't mind throwing the word philosophy in there uh your world view how are you analyzing what what is your basis of looking at the world this worldly wisdom and this worldly wisdom this worldly philosophy it's anti-god anti-christ uh it's going to be earthly from your soul soulish and demonic and it says uh the, the it, this will produce worldly behaviors that are contrary to wisdom here's the verse if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition so we'll just say jealousy and selfish again this is i like the word selfish in there because uh, ambition itself, Paul was a fairly ambitious individual. I mean, he wanted to reach everywhere that Christ had been. So he was ambitious, but that would not be, in a sense, selfish ambition. He wasn't advancing his own cause. He's advancing the cause of Christ. But anyway, jealousy and selfish ambition. If you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition, this is the English standard, in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes from above. This is not it but is earthly, unspiritual, and demonic. And where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there you'll find disorder. This is the fruit. Disorder. And every evil practice or every evil manner or vile thing. So we'll just say evil practice or matter, whatever it is. This is the result. It'll be chaos, 
and evil, which is the opposite of it, it, evil. That word means not good. It means worthless. And so it's going to be disorder and worthless, everything you're doing, if you have worldly wisdom. And here's the out, outline right here. Point A, it says jealousy is zelon, meaning to have. That's right here, jealousy. Uh, it's to have a warm warmth of feeling for or against. So that word right here, jealousy, wherever there's jealousy, that is a feeling. That is not logic. That's not truth. That is there's something driving you. It could be your passion. It could be something in your heart. It's not truth. It's not intelligence. It's, it's, it's an emotion. It's a feeling. Uh, not based on reason, but on feelings, emotion. The Greek word zeal means to boil. So wherever there's jealousy, and again, the Greek word is zelon here from uh, zeal, which means to boil. They're boiling with, or you're boiling with some kind of thought, some kind of feeling, some kind of desire. You're jealous. It is a pursuit and defense of an idea or thing. It can be envious and contentious rivalry. So this, this right here is not just you having a feeling, but you're now into rivalry. You're heading into conflict. Uh, selfish ambition, meaning rivalry. Ambition refers to self-seeking, a feud or a fraction. So this is, you're, you're boiling with an emotion, a desire, and you're going to selfishly, it's all wrapped up in yourself. This is what I want. That is a bomb. That is a, a piece of, the, uh, that's loaded, explosive, socially, emotionally. That person is going to cause a problem. Now, I wonder sometimes in my own life, and again, it's like, well, it's like, well, I know a person just like that. Well, you're looking at a person right now just like that. I mean, I, I've had this. I've had bitter and amb selfish ambition. And it's like when you come into an arena, a group, a relationship with this, you're, you're just driving, you're squeezing out problems. And so this, don't, don't do this. I mean, this you have to identify. And it, to, <laughs> the idea here is not to say, yeah, I know some people like that. In fact, I know an entire political party just like that. yes. You know, those are the problems. It's like that James is not saying, you know, to, he's saying, you look around you. Do you find these people in your community? He's saying, you adulterous people, you, you. He's saying, you're the one that it's like, it's easy to find the problem. But the reason they're having so many problems out there, they always seem like they're explosive. They always seem like they're divisive. It's like every time I'm around, it's like they're, the, wait a minute. Is it them or is it me causing the problem? And at James' point here is, you, the individual, are, th are the reason for this. And I'm not talking about you. I'm, I'm studying this as, my, as, as myself. So don't, don't think, ah, he's talking about us. It's like, you were all like me. No. Uh, so bitter jealousy, selfish ambition. And the fruit of this jealousy and selfish ambition is disorder and evil. The disorder is instability. That's a that's cl clue right there, a key. This disorder that comes from jealousy and selfish ambition, this is an explosion. This is, this is going to cause strife, division. Nothing's going to fit together. It's going to break things apart. And that means nothing is stable. Uh, disorder, it means instability. So a relationship with this person, or if you are the person in this relationship, you are making the relationship unstable. If you are in a political party, if you're in a ministry, if you're in a business, and this is how it's running, it is unstable because your business is not based on a principle of we're going to provide a good product and make the customer happy. We're going to try to get whatever we can and do whatever we need to make this thing work for our advantage. And so the standard for your product is going to vary depending on how much you can make. Law and order can't be this way. Imagine laws that are based or a government or a police system or a judicial system based on jealousy and selfish ambition. Oh, wow, think about America now. It's like if you've got, some, you've got divisions of your government that are using, that are functioning for a jealous reason, envy, and selfish ambition trying to advance their own cause, and now they're going to now provide justice, it's going to be disorder, it's going to be unstable. It's like, why is it wrong here, but not wrong here? Don't be asking us questions. Now you're going to have to start censoring because it's going to be worldly wisdom. And that, that's, not, that's not any particular party. That, that's any time you start doing. This can be the church. 
Now you can think about local churches today, but I'm thinking about church history, periods of church history where the church got control of the government and they, they wanted their way, they had selfish ambition, and they created instability. I mean, they were, ki- well, you know, the church, there's times the church was killing Christians for having the Bible, especially when the English Bible first came out. It was illegal to have an English Bible. Why? Because the church was envious and they had selfish ambition. And if you have a Bible... You can confront us and say, but if you don't have a Bible, we're fine. And so we're going to have to be disorderly and unstable. It's like, it's like you, why are you killing that person? Because they're printing a Bible. They're trying to teach the Word of God to people. And we don't want them knowing the Word of God because we'll tell them the Word of God. Oh, and that's the church. And that's, that's, not, that's not even like a stretch. That's like, I mean, there's volumes written about stuff like that. I've got some of the pages of some of the Bibles from that time period that have been preserved. Okay, disorder and vile practice or evil thing. Every kind of disorder or evil practice or vile thing. And vile is, wor- the word means, the word vile or evil in the Greek, it means worthless. I mean, that you're, you're fighting for something that is it's less than air. It's empty. It's, it's worthless. It's, it's chaos producing emptiness. So that's the same word, a similar word at least, used for idols in the Old Testament. Worthless, vanity, they're, they're empty which would figure out worldly wisdom, whatever it's producing, if it's a worldly philosophy, it's going to be empty. It's going to be idolatry. It's going to be worthless, vanity. There's nothing here but the wind. And that is the result of this worldly wisdom. And that, 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 it's nice to see it broken down like that. Um, I got a new eraser and I don't like it. takes me forever okay you always try to improve it ends up going backwards chapter 3 verse 17 and 18 instead describes the wisdom from above that looks like when applied to the worldview or a philosophy of life now if you're going to apply and this this wisdom from above it, it's the spirit of god it's the heart of god it's the word of god it's the wisdom it's you can see it in proverbs wisdom help the person person of wisdom was there at creation at god's side we see that in 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 uh, in proverbs it says the wisdom from above is, first of all, pure, that meaning pure, dedicated to what it is. It, it's, it's, this is what, it's not it got other impurities in it. It is right here coming from God. It is peaceable, meaning it's going to come and it's going to come in peace. It's not going to create chaos. It's going to create peace. It's going to come in peace. It's not going to come with conflict. It's going to be gentle, meaning it's going to have to come in a sense of of making room for itself it can't just roll in like a, you know a, a, a bomb it can't roll in like a, a like a truck it's going to have to come in and and be welcome and make a place for itself humble it's going to be humble and then open to reason the english standard actually says open to reason it just doesn't come in and say shut up listen to me it's going to come in and say this is you if you're starting with someone that's in total depravity you're going to have to start and realize it's going to be a sequence of events that's going to lead them to logic you can't just come in and say shut up get over here that's unreasonable you're going to have to address where they're at and begin to move them through this process of logic it's going to have to be gentle patient uh full of mercy and good fruits meaning uh, you're going to have to be, you know, in a sense, non-judgmental. You've judged this is wrong, but in the sense, I'm going to help lead you into the truth. Impartial, which is meaning right there. That's that's the opposite of that word that we had: disorder or unstable. Impartial means it's always the same. Meaning this is the rule. If it's my side or your side, this is the rule. And on this case, I was wrong. Here's the penalty. I need to do this. It's impartial. Again, now that does not mean hard in the sense of unreasonable because sometimes, as you know, dealing with children, dealing with different individuals, people are different, and sometimes you need to accommodate their situation. So right there, when it says uh, impartial, meaning that, that means you know, ruling with an iron scepter. I mean, this is the way it is. We're not changing. But the very fact you're open to reason would mean, okay, we, there's a logical reason why we would make an adjustment here. Why is the law not even? Ah, there's a logical reason why we've got to make an adjustment here in the application of this law. And then sincere. 
and a harvest of righteousness. What is produced by this is righteousness, which is the nature of God. It is truth. It is goodness. It is wholesome. It is completeness. It is in purity. And it is sown in peace. It is not sown in warfare. It's not sown by invasion. It's sown in peace. And it is sown by peacemakers. So the person that is sowing this, these fruits, this, these characteristics, they're going to have to be peacemakers. They have to be out intentionally avoiding warfare among people. I mean, again, you're, you know, if you have to go to war, you have to go to war. But you have come as a peacemaker. And you're sowing it in peace, not in hostility. You don't come in war and in hostility produce righteousness. You come as a peacemaker, sowing in peace, producing righteousness. And again, notice the peace right there. That is what we have saw coming through these verses. Now, chapter 4, verse 1, the new material. If that's the situation, why do we not have James writing to his people? He just finished this. Why are there, is there not peace among you? Where are the peacemakers? Where is that? I see wars, fights. So you are not, the very fact that I see wars and quarreling and fighting means you are not producing righteousness. You're producing this disorder and instability. You're, you're, whatever you're doing, you're destroying the very thing God is trying to build. You're destroying it as he's building. So here's the verses. And this is not, again, I, I don't want to re, be, be redundant, but my entire ministry is redundant. Uh, chapter 4, verse 1, is he's not writing about those people over there in Corinth or those people back there in Jerusalem where they fled from you know, thank God you're up here in Syria and we've got things figured out. He's writing to people in Syria that apparently have fled Judea, fled Jerusalem under persecution, p p political purposes possibly, but mainly Christian persecution. Uh, what causes quarrels and fights among you? You fled those people and now you're up here and James is writing to them because he probably knew some of them when he was in town there with them. What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? So the word here, Quarrels, they're in, within them. Quarrels, fights among you. I mean, and this is not with the world. You're having fights and quarrels with the rich, with the oppressors, with the government. No, you're having fights and quarrels among you, your own people. You're having fights and quarrels. Is it not this that your passions are at war within you? Your passions are at war within you and again the word there you uh we could see is is members we'll, we'll look at this coming up here but there's this is what's happening there's there's quarrels and fights this is the result this is what you see why because this is what's on the inside because this is going on inside of you you don't have peace in you you're not a peacemaker sowing in peace you have passions and war within you and that's causing within your people in your relationships quarrels and fights I turn the page, and here's the Greek meanings of these here. you got your Greek transliteration. Quarrels, polemoi, meaning war. This, this quarrels, uh, this, this means, and this is where we've got to make a decision. War, there's wars, and it's translated war, battle, or strife. So this is the word that if, if the, the Jewish wars, the Jewish wars with Rome are about to break out, that's going to be a physical war. That's the word. But in this case, are they having wars amongst themselves? And that probably would mean quarrels or strife. And it's, but it's the, same, it's the same word, but it's more used in the ideal of a social setting. Fights, meaning a fight, and can refer to a fight in the sphere of words, or the manifestation and production of, of strife, contention, or quarrels. So this fights right here will say words and contention. So now they've got these divisions, strife within them with words and fighting. They're arguing because, well, they've got passions and they're at war. And the next one right here, passions, is in this word right here, the passion is hedonon which is an important word for us, it means, watch this, pleasurable to the senses or sensual pleasure. Hedonon, it comes uh, from the word hedos, 
and it has to do with pleasure. And again, passions is a good word because it's pleasures, sensual pleasures. This is where we get the word hedonism. Uh, people, hedonism is a philosophy. It's a philosophy, and it's, it's rampant in our culture. If someone in, uh, ascribes to it or not, you know, like we can say we are a Christian, uh, and hopefully there's a philosophy of, of Christianity, uh, and you could say you're a hedonist or hedonism, uh, or you could just be practicing it, following it. And hedonism is, well, I've got it written down here so I can read it correctly. It's the attitude that, uh, the philosophy that the most important thing in life is pleasure. Let me read it right here, which is a philosophy. Oh, yeah. The Greek word hedon is the source of the English word hedonism, which is the philosophy that views pleasure as the primary goal of life. Now, just stop and think about that. First of all, before we run off and judge everybody in the world, pleasure. Um, again, this pleasure, th th this is, a, again, a, a double-edged sword because we can go to 2 Timothy where God says all these things God created for you to enjoy, telling Timothy, meaning there's going to become, coming out of this, this church movement here, may, I don't want to say because of letters like this, but an overcompensation is going to be, the opposite of hedonism is going to be asceticism where you don't, you don't enjoy anything. You limit your food, you limit your sleep, you, you limit everything. I'm not going to, even t Paul says, telling Timothy, the day is going to come where people will follow the teachings of demons. And we're like, what kind of stuff? Well, th they'll forbid marriage because we don't want to be hedonistic. We, we're in a marriage, there's pleasure in marriage. See, there's pleasure in marriage. The Bible talks about that. There's pleasure in marriage. So, for a lot of reasons, I mean, from relationships down to sensuality, all, I mean, there's all kinds of time, you know, there's the, marriage is a good thing, you know, enjoy the wife of your youth, it's a good thing, uh, but demonism will push it to the place of not being a hedonist or hedonism, but push it to the place of asceticism of like, it's wrong to be married, you should just be single, and food, certain foods, do not you know, avoid certain foods, Paul says the teachings of demons are going to come, in 2 Timothy, are going to forbid marriage and forbid eating certain food. Now, again, there is a place for a good, wise diet, okay? I mean, there's certain things you shouldn't, you know, you make your own decision. I'm not a dietitian, and there's things I probably shouldn't eat. Uh, but, you know, I think of like a big bag of Cheetos or something. Is that even food? I don't know if it's, it's food coloring on plastic. I don't know. But I don't know. It's good. I eat it. <laughs> And Cheetos is one of our sponsors. Buy Cheetos today. It's like, okay. But, but I, get, I mean, that would be, that'd be something where you'd want to make a, a wise choice. It's like, okay. Uh, but that's not, that's not asceticism. That would be being reasonable. This is chemicals going in my body. It's not even food. But to say that you're going to somehow, I'm going to punish myself. I'm not going to be married. I'm not going to enjoy life. Anything that I find pleasure in, it must be sin. I find pleasure in, in mowing my yard and having, a green, having green grass. Oh, it must be a sin because I really find joy in this. Okay, so I'm going to just let the weeds grow and let my house fall apart. Look how holy I am. I'm not even taking care of my stuff. It's like, well, no, no. There's, again, a balance between this. So th be careful of this word pleasure. This ideal of sensual pleasure of your entire life is bent on finding pleasure. And you don't have anything higher than pleasure. Even relationships are used for your own pleasure. Sometimes you'll sacrifice yourself for a relationship. Someone that is a true hedonist is not going to sacrifice the pleasure of a relationship if it causes them any kind of a burden. For example, this, this relationship is becoming a burden. We've got too many kids. I'm gone. It's like, well, wait, wait. I'm going to find pleasure in my life. It's like, well, what about these, these responses? It's like, no, not, gonna, not going to do that. And that would be what this would be, hedonism. And so these are quarrels and fights are breaking out among the people because of passions. And here's some more information here. It says, this is the attitude or philosophy of the readers of this book. Their chief goal in life is pleasure. These pleasures are carrying on a military-like campaign against the souls of these believers. Because of their pursuit of pleasure, their souls, first of all, their soul is being attacked. Now, 
I can stop right here and I can say, I experience this. There's certain things that I have. I have a good life. I enjoy life. But there's certain times when I, I have something I want, whatever. Maybe it's you know, something as simple as, as some time off. Finally, it's the weekend. I've got some time off. And then someone calls and they want this or they need this. Or God forbid, Tony would want me to you know, empty the dishwasher or something. It's like, uh, I, I'm trying to be funny there, but no one laughed. Maybe you feel <laughs> kind of awkward. <laughs> Tony very rarely asks me to empty the dishwasher. Cause, but... I'm, pr- I'm in pursuit of pleasure, not responsibility. And so now these pleasures, and that's very simple, this could be very extreme, is waging war against my soul, so my soul is ripped apart, and now I'm going to enter into relationship with other people. My goal is pleasure, my soul is broken, and I come up here, and what am I going to do with another person who's also seeking pleasure, and their soul is broken? It's going to be quarrels and fights as we strive to get what we want. Uh, and so it's a military campaign. Here's this word, pleasure, where we get our word hedonism or hedon from in 2 Peter. This is interesting, I think. You find this interesting. This is the word in context. Uh, 2 Peter 2.13. Ah, I got to read this whole thing. They count it pleasure to revel in the daytime. They are blots and blemishes reveling in their deceptions while they feast with you. Now, this is the word pleasures or passions or he done on i'm going to read this it is listen to this second timothy or second peter and i hope this is okay but this cat this whole chapter is about people that have this is this passion that they're following their sensual passion sensual the pursuit of sensual pleasure is driving their life now, in this situation, 2 Peter, he's warning them. He's warning them that they're, they're, in, they're in leadership positions in your church. They're not in the world. They've come from the world. Maybe they had a, a business. Maybe they were in a religion. Maybe they were in some kind of an institution, of a philosopher, some, you know, something in the world. And they came into the church as a believer, or maybe not as a believer, but now they're in the church coming from business, coming from the academic world, coming from uh, some religious world, and now they're in the church, and they're just bringing their sensual pleasures over here and are now working the church as a leader. And and Peter's Peter's writing 2 Peter. Uh, This is around 64, 64 A.D. Peter apparently is writing this book in prison, uh, and he is going to be executed Uh, shortly after if it's a few days a few weeks this is peter being persecuted he's in prison he's going to be executed by nero and this is right after this mark is with him and as mark is going to begin writing the book of mark either at this time or immediately after this or the book of mark is being assembled right here at this time so this is the end of of peter's life the main ver- ver- uh, verse we're looking at is 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 13. I'm reading this in the NIV. Uh, did I do this right? 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 13. The, uh, second, second Peter. Oh, yeah, yeah. They will be paid back with harm for the harm they have done. I left that part off. Their idea of pleasure is to carouse in broad daylight, they are both they are blots and blemishes reveling in their pleasures while they feast with you. Uh, that feast with you would probably be a church event, like some kind of a fellowship meal. Chapter 2, verse 1. Here it is, the whole thing. But there were also false prophets among the people in the Old Testament, just as there will be false teachers among you. Now, he's not talking to society in general. He's talking about the church peter peter's final letter there will be just like they had false prophets in the old testament there's going to be teachers pop up in your churches that are false teachers they will secretly introduce destructive heresies paul calls these doctrines of demons even denying the sovereign lord they're going to be in your church denying the sovereign lord who bought them bringing swift destruction on themselves they're going to be denying the atoning work of Jesus Christ. Paul mentions some doctrines they teach. 
here, Peter addresses, the first thing they're going to address, he addresses, is they're going to deny Jesus Christ and his work and still want to be part of the church. Now, my friends, this is Peter writing 64 AD, but there are groups of Christians around today that they are Christians. They hold to what they call Christian principles, basically do not judge, and they, they deny Jesus Christ. And it says, bringing swift destruction on themselves. And again, I always wonder about that. It doesn't seem swift enough. Uh, but you know, that's another conversation. Verse 2. Many will follow their shameful ways and will bring the way of truth into disrepute. So you've got the way of truth, the word of God, that, that we're talking about from James, that James is urging us in today. But these people are going to join that group and now bring it over here. And now all of a sudden, the way of truth is like, yeah. That doesn't really make sense. Look at all those people. And they're going to, the way of truth is going to come under criticism because of the way they're living. Um, in their greed, these teachers will exploit you. Now, again, the reason they're in the ministry, the reason they're teachers leading the church is there's money to be made. Whenever there's people, there's power. And wherever there's people, there's finances and money. And if you can somehow persuade them, if it be in business, if it be in academics, if it be religion, so there's, there's the priesthood always had power. If the Jewish priests, the Levites, they got their tithes, and the, they, 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 there's the priestly quarter in Jerusalem. In Jesus' day, there's the priestly quarter on the western hill. That's where all the nice houses were. Because they had access, they had control of not just the temple, but society. The marketplaces were controlled by uh, the godfather, Annas, that Jesus, when he turned those, the tables over and upset that, that was all controlled by the high priest. And that was one of the reasons would have got in trouble. Nonetheless, if you want to make money, you can get into religion and make money. Especially if you can use words and be deceptive and manipulate people. Many will follow their shameful ways and be brought to okay, dispute. Uh, these teachers will exploit you. Peter's saying to the people he's writing to, you will be exploited by false teachers. They'll exploit you with stories they have made up. They're not going to teach you the word of God. They're going to tell stories. They're going to call it church. You're going to come to church. You're going to gather together. And then they're going to tell you stories. Well, what are these stories going to be about? Well, they're going to be to support their greed to exploit you, and they're going to do it by telling you stories. That doesn't tell you what kind of stories. It means myths. It means they're making stuff up. It's something, well, Paul's going to say, itching ears will want to hear. It's like, oh, and they'll come back to hear another story. It's not, the, the truth is here. They're over here. But they're, all the Christians are coming here because there's stories here. And their stories are like, well, now we need finances. And there's finances, and, well, we're not done. With stories they've made up, their condemnation has long been hanging over them, and their destruction has not been sleeping. Now, th this is not new, because this is exactly what the Old Testament prophets did. Jeremiah ran into all, Jeremiah, Isaiah, uh, think of Amos, think of Micah. Every one of them ran into a conflict with the religious leaders who were led by the false prophets and the priesthood. Jeremiah wasn't allowed. He was a priest. His family was the priest. They lived in Anathoth. And he was rejected by his family. And eventually the priest says, you can't come on the temple mount. You can't come up here. And then he had trouble with the prophets. Well, okay, I'll go hang out with the prophets. And the prophets were prophesying, peace, prosperity, everything's going to be fine. People love they, that big group over there. Jeremiah said, that's not what's happening. We're, we're, we're in big trouble. And, and, and he ended up being persecuted, put in stock. So he got persecuted by the priests, the religious leaders, and the prophets. And so what's taking place right here is not like, oh, it must be. This is, Peter says, this is what happened in the Old Testament. It's going to happen to you too. Some of you make a big deal about that. There was prophets in the Old Testament, but there will only be teachers in the New Testament. It means there's no prophets here today. That's worth looking at, but that, you know. That's not the point. Uh, for if God did not, he goes, if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but sent them to hell, uh, Tartarus, putting them in gloomy dungeons, if he did not spare the ancient world, the flood, didn't spare Sodom and Gomorrah, surely they're not, he's not going to spare these guys. Again, we'd love to read all that stuff. 
It says, the Lord, if, if this is so, then the Lord knows how to rescue godly men from trials. I mean, you're going to face trials, but you'll be rescued, just like uh, the ancient world was on a couple of uh, t- occasions. And to hold the unrighteous for the day of judgment while continuing their punishment. This is especially true of those who follow the corrupt desire of the sinful nature and despise authority. In this case, the authority would be the true authority of the Word of God. Bold and arrogant, these men are not afraid to slander celestial beings, yet even angels, they were more stronger and powerful. They had enough sense not to do that. Uh, But these men blaspheme, verse 12, blaspheme in matters they do not understand. They are brute beasts, creatures of instinct, meaning just of the psychic, born only to be caught and destroyed like beasts, they too will perish." They'll be paid back with harm for the harm they have done. Their idea of pleasure is to carouse in broad daylight. They are blots and blemishes reveling in their pleasures while they feast with you. With their eyes full of adultery, they never stop sinning. They seduce the unstable. See, they're unstable. They're they're, uh, they're, unstable. the word that we saw earlier where there there's no stability to them they get them there and they seduce them and they are experts in greed and a cursed brood meaning they know how to manipulate money and get it to where they want it they have left the straight way they've left the truth and wandered off to follow the way of balaam son of beor remember he came down and he prophesied the word of god prophesied the word of god but there's so much money to be made if he would curse them he couldn't curse them with the word of god But he did step aside and say, hey, I will tell you how you can get them to curse themselves. And he led them astray with adultery. And that's that's the and so he made his money. He couldn't he couldn't change the word of God, but he could compromise his ministry and make the money by doing what the world wanted. He says that's exactly what they are. But he was rebuked by the donkey, goes on, talks about the madness of the prophet. These men, okay, we can go on with that right there. Oh boy, goodness, so sorry. Uh, that's second peter three that's using the word pleasure titus three also uses the word pleasure and luke 8 14 we'll pick this up next week about the prodigal son uh going off and squandering his inheritance on pleasures or that word hedonism so they've got quarrels and fights breaking out among them because of passions They're, these pleasures and the wars that's going on within them and that's individually inside of them they can't control their pleasures and that's going to lead to chaos in there and that's james's people he's writing to right now that's what he's addressing again is you need this wisdom from above and this is a real problem going on with them we can see it individually and in their church or their congregation and eventually it's going to take place in their whole society i'll pray and we're done father we thank you for the chance to look into your word we ask that we would judge ourselves sincerely that we'd be reasonable and receive the truth of the word of god and allow you to conform us into the image of jesus christ we ask that we would draw close to you that we'd resist the devil and that we would again become the people you've called us to be at this time that we may produce the fruits of righteousness sowing in peace as peacemakers in jesus name we pray amen thank you for your time